you very much for joining us today or whenever you're listening to this. Another Let's Chat PE and all related things. And um, my guest today, uh, well, let's just say some people are vastly experienced and some are really knowledgeable and highly published. And my guest today is both of those things and lots, lots more. Her contribution to the field has been nothing short of immense. And it's an absolute pleasure to, well, to just listen to a voice that really needs to be listened to. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us, Vicky Randall, Dr. Vicky Randall. Um, don't know how often you use the doctor, but anyway, it's great to, <laughs> it's great to have you with us. So thank you for your, your time. And as we always do, um, I'm not really a big fan of introducing others because you will tell your own story far better than me. So um, for people who might not be familiar with your work, um, over to you for uh, an intro that could be as brief or as long as you want. Thanks, Greg. I was going to I was going to jump in there and go, oh, there's going to be another cat and other category here that he's going <laughs> to he's going to fall into. Oh, Greg, it's a pleasure. Thanks for introdu- um, inviting me. I always love our chats and I know they can go on for hours and hours so um we'll have to keep an eye on that but um likewise just learn have learned so much from you every time we sit and chat and um put the world to right so why not come here and do that some more it's been too long so thanks for the invite um well um i feel like i've got a step up to that introduction now um just have to have a little think um yeah i won't i won't drain on too long about this but i think yeah, it got me thinking actually and I thought how am I going to make sense of my career in a in a few sort of uh kind of key mess kind of key events really but yeah in a nutshell um PE PE born and bred I would say um started you know career journey for PE back um back in the early 2000s training at St Mary's University in, in Twickenham where this will tell you how long ago that feels now. They don't even run those courses anymore. I mean, that was quite a scary, a scary thing when I learned that quite a while ago, actually, on a four year undergrad B ed where you could train just in phys ed. Um, it was a halcyon day, I think, for PE then. You could just immerse yourself in it. And, and I did. And so four years training there um was able to learn around PE across all key stages and stages and just got that r- real love of the subject from its very early stages and early years right through to sixth form and beyond um from then I went into teaching yeah secondary private school actually um which I was tussling with whether to go down that route but at the time I don't know if I don't I don't know how many people know this but I was also training as a performance coach for England netball um and I happened to land on my feet at a school where the uh, uh, England coach was deputy head, which was a major coup. And I managed to um, really get myself into that netball performance, netball England world. And and so, yeah, I went down the private sector for my first year or two of teaching and really gave me that chance to develop my coaching career. Didn't know which way I was going to go at the time. And um I pretty soon got disillusioned teaching in the private school. I think at St. Mary's, I love the sport. I love being able to apply like my coaching, my after school, like work with the teams and do all that wider stuff. But PE was just becoming so the most important thing to me. And um, it, it really was, and this is no criticism, but just for those schools, it was the importance of the trophies and the weekend and the sport and the curriculum ticked along. But I just really wanted to throw myself at the curriculum. So I moved back to Twickenham um, and started teaching in a school um, in Kingston. Um, and I became it was the year of the SSCO. So I became a head of PE, school sport coordinator and really got back into primary PE then um, working with those clusters and. Uh, then got seconded with AFP and the CFPT to do some uh, curriculum um, around the new curriculum in secondary in 2008. So I was involved in that delivery and rollout, loved it, was studying for my MA at the time and just was looking at curriculum. And I suppose it would have been called what we would probably call a concept curriculum now, but this is 14, 15 years ago. I completely changed our curriculum in secondary to move away from And I loved it. I was looking at how we could really rewrite curriculum ideas, really engage and empower our learners. 
And as a state school, which didn't really achieve much on a sport level, with that new curriculum, we were now beating the grammar schools and the private schools. So it was kind of like, OK, we get the curriculum right. The other stuff looks after itself a little bit more. So, yeah, but I had to hit a crossroads then around coaching or teaching. Um, and at the time, I was coach for county, uh, regional around London um, region and Essex and all that London and wider region for England netball. And at the start of Super League was coaching the junior Super League for Brunel Hullican. So it was a decision, teaching or coaching. Um, and my heart was still in PE. So I left my coaching career and my England career. I think it wouldn't have gone any further, to be honest. It was a real time of change for England netball. But I, I loved my netball. I loved my sport. But it 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 was time for focus on PE and and. Uh, yeah, and I just then started to move more into teacher education and primary and found myself at Roehampton in 2009. And what an era to be at Roehampton University with some of some really inspiring colleagues, um, Ian Pickup, Laurie Price, Julie Shaughnessy, Emmerich Catel, Dom Hayden Davis, um, Jean Key, just really instrumental in shaping my vision there around what primary physical education was. And I realized I knew nothing when I got there about primary PE. Um, so I had a real baptism of fire, but I was just 26 at the time. So this was a real, a real crazy world into initial teacher education and retraining and learning around primary PE and what that was about. And, and for me, they were really putting primary PE on the map then um, as a, as a space, as a discipline in its own right. And yeah. And then from there to Winchester, and I've been there for the last 10 years and various roles there, actually, you probably heard me harp on over the years, Greg, but I've a uh, PE coordinator there for ITE. Um, I've headed up faculty, the research for the Faculty of Education. I've um, been responsible for our research submission um, as, a, as a university, as a faculty area. Um, I've developed a centre for CPD and consultancy there and um, so that's sort of over the last decade and yeah and that's where I am now still still going strong fantastic so Sorry, that wasn't very um, quick at all was it who cares who cares it's fascinating and no, I've known you a while and uh, I'm still finding out you know there was stuff that you mentioned there that I, I wasn't aware of and um, all adds to the rich tapestry of life mm -hmm. and but yeah that team at Roehampton that was some there was some seriously serious players in that team and uh people who are highly respected one or two are a bit scary but <laughs> scary and respected but um yeah all doing great stuff must have been a really good place to work um and you know one of the charges that's sometimes put at academics uh, or people who work at universities is you know that, that they've become detached or you know the whole ivory tower syndrome but you, you know, one of the things that's always amazed me about the way you go about your work is you, you've always stayed connected to that field and you've always been looking at having impact and in some cases probably not too much of an exaggeration to transform um, the field or certainly better the field. And you set about that as you probably, anyone listening could hear with such gusto and energy that it's just, it's just fantastic and, and, and contagious, I think, I think. But you do see things quite strategically. Uh, is that fair to say? Um, um, I'd say... Do you do that? Do you have I, to work I think hard at that? I would, I would say that colleagues will see when the light bulb moment goes off in my head, they do one and, and run a mile. They're like, oh, no, she's had another idea. Um, I'm massively guilty of that. I think... Possibly I get really excited about something or can see some dots that need joining together that haven't been. And I get, yeah, I get really excited about that particular idea or that concept or or bringing people together to do that. Um, I definitely need people working with me who are complete finishers. That's something I've really learned about myself that, um, but I think we're all guilty of it. When we get excited by the initial buzz that the, the the working it through I'm like oh no that's a fine detail thing that's for someone else to sort out but but no I I, I think so I, I I've got better at that I think over time and I've I've seen how I've started something and not seen it through and and the um how disappointing that's been or frustrating that's been um so it's definitely something on myself I'm working on but 
yeah the big, big the bigger view I, I, I like to put my head up and kind of go well who are all these amazing people and what can we do together um which, which is exciting and, it, and and there's nothing more exciting than collaborating with people I think um especially in this great profession we're in there's so many people that want to go out and achieve that yeah can be quite yeah. scary when you bring everyone together on that front but you sort of navigate organizations groups strategic bodies that I mean, I would have always have thought and seen as inaccessible. And, and I've got, you know, I, I very much associate you and I don't want to sort of go down a rabbit hole that people can't relate to, but um, I associate you with an enormous amount of energy on that all party parliamentary group on yeah. the fit and healthy child that uh, you might correct me here, but it feels like seven years ago or something like that. Yeah, possibly. Um, yeah. Going you know, far- or, all of a sudden, emails are coming into inbox. Like, we need to get involved in in this. Like, how did you work the corridors of Westminster <laughs> to get to get in the room? A phrase that we've spoken about a lot. Who's in the room? And you got yourself in the room. Like, why and how? Uh, do you know, just being ballsy and sending off, just set, just finding out who do I need to speak to. And I think generally people are people will pass you on to the right person eventually and I think if you if you send enough emails and ask enough questions the the key things I've learned about that is find the person you need to speak to and I literally sent off an email to their secretary going I see that you're an organization interested in this I'm really passionate about making sure that what we do from an academic perspective is based on theory and supports practice um, I see through your reports that you're trying to do that. So it's it's kind of like scoping out what those people are doing and finding where you can be useful in that. Because um, what I got back from that, that um, from the APPG quite quickly was the secretary is going, we're massively looking to engage more academics because we want our reports to be evidence based and rigorous because we think that's going to have more influence in political spheres and and, and can help support that. Um, so that was great. That that gave me a sort of inroad to go, well, let, and then I said, well, let me help you with that. So it's rather than I think working with organizations, you've got to find a thing where you're offering a solution for them. You're not just trying to put forward your own agenda. And where those two things can marry up, that can be quite powerful because, okay, well, leave it with me. I think I can bring a team of academics in this space who are going to be interested to share their research. And then obviously academics are really um constantly looking for ways that that research can have impact and be be used in practice so yeah the APPG was a, was a really good example of where you had a group of people who were just like we, we don't know how to work with your group of people well we don't know how to work with yours so let's let's try that together yeah that was just an email Greg and and just saying how can I help um and but, I think yeah oh, sorry no I was just going to say I think sometimes we we tend to kind of go have this can you do this will you use this rather than saying is this any use to you and how can I help your organization and as soon as that someone's sitting there going oh actually we would really benefit from this you know you've got them and you've started a conversation and you can start to grow that discussion a bit more yeah but I think that's so applicable to anybody who's advocating for PE whether it be within their own school um, Mm -hmm. or you know externally or all the way through to Westminster as you did but you know, try to understand how can we help you? What's your agenda, head teacher? You know, how do you see the vision? Um, I was on a call with a, a, a great teacher this morning uh, who's just started in a new, very under-resourced school in uh, overseas. And we were talking about exactly that. Why did, where does, why did the principal appoint you? And what do they want to get? And they won't always have the headspace. So having those email nudges or... A little bit prepared like i've done this does this sound all right does it does it fit in with you you know they're all the things that i think i've become very aware we don't we don't really prepare teachers for navigating those sort of negotiations or getting access um uh very well in their well, certainly not in the initial teacher education maybe people saying it shouldn't be there because it's about it's about navigating the place of work etc but um i digress a little bit because you not only access other organisations, but you've also started your own. And a few years back, yeah. yourself and 
Gerald Griggs, who some people would have uh, read his copious output. <laughs> copious um, output. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the man who writes. Um, so you, you set up an organisation with him yeah, yeah. Uh, around primary PE. Yeah. So tell us about where that came from and, and why you established it and what it does. Yeah, so a bit of background with that. Like, based on what you were just saying about with, like, the APPG and that, I, I think there's been a, a danger of us in PE to kind of get stuck in our own echo chambers a bit and 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 confirm our own biases or strengths or whatever it is. And And for real growth as a subject, you need to speak to people outside of that to learn. And I've, I've, I'm certainly motivated by that. I, I think we've got a wonderful profession, but once you go outside that profession, you can learn a lot more. And I think with the with the primary peer assembly well it started off by us having an idea that we wanted to have our own dedicated academic journal for primary PE there are lots of physical education journals out there um there's some like five or six really mainstream gold standard ones and we thought well wouldn't it be great to have a primary phys ed one and when we submitted what we thought was a pretty rigorous um application with a fantastic board of really credible academics internationally the feedback was primary PE isn't uh, yet in a space to command its own journal for academic publications. So we thought, OK, let's where where are we now? Well, this is probably where we are. We're going to get that feedback from other journals, no doubt. And we did. And we thought, well, let's take a few steps back. So what do we need to do? Well, we we need to show over time that P primary P is its own research evidence theoretical base um but we're not there yet clearly so initially the plan was with the with PPA was to hold a space that over time would evidence this growing engagement of texts and academic resources and publications that was a growing international community of people engaged in primary P research and practice and since the time we set up the website for PPA, it, it has grown extensively if you look back over the decades. But when we started with that, we thought, well, wouldn't it be good to have a one stop shop of, you know, thinking selfishly as a teacher educator here, a place where I can send my students to find books or academic articles or wider publications or, you know, like APPG reports or other um, community groups in PE that they can learn from. And there's loads online. So then we wanted to bring everything together. But also along that time, we were, I suppose, and, and I can't speak for Gerald here, this is definitely something I was motivated by, a slight growing disillusionment with organisations around PE and sport. They were becoming increasingly, we felt, commercial, political. So we made a decision at that time that this was going to be from the ground up. We'd have no sponsorship. We weren't looking for anything as a product. We weren't doing anything like that. We wouldn't even have an agenda other than advocacy and promotion of, of voices in primary PE. And that voice could be anybody. It could be a parent. It could be a sports coach, someone from the NHS, whoever felt they had something to say or wanted to know or learn a bit more about. Um, so from that point, that's, that's probably why, I guess, we don't go out and roll out a programme. We wait for someone to come to us and say, we'd love to know about, a bit about this. And Joe and I go, well, we'll see what we can do. And we'll try and bring some people together to do that. Or we'd love to share our community initiative or our research project. Great. Give us some details. We'll share that for you. So it it was trying to flip, really, I suppose. It was trying to evidence everything in one space so we could put forward a, a credible claim in however many years to come it would take um, that Primary P was, was a cred, you know, had its own space and its own right, but also be more voice led from the ground up around what people wanted rather than telling them what they should need potentially I don't if that answers your question at all I think that was I think that's where I hope I speak for Gerald and I when I say that but that was certainly my motivation to be involved yeah that's great and maybe we'll reach out to Gerald and see if he can mm. follow up but it's he'll, a, give it's you a the really... truth. he'll give you the actual version <laughs> of events <laughs> but it's a really cool website which I think uh, Gerald was uh, convened. I'm, I'm not going to give him credit for uh, preparing the website and, and building it, but it, it's really nice. And he, I believe he did actually. I believe it was him and his wife. Like did... he told me it was more his wife than him. Yeah, I think it was more than. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, and um, but I'll put the I'll put the uh, web link in the notes that accompany this broadcast, oh, thanks, and uh, people can um, go and check it out. And it is an awesome, um, an awesome resource, um, which brings us on nicely, really, on you know the the minefield, the contested area that is PE, and in particular primary PE. I mean, do you think primary PE is more contested than? Secondary PE? I, I don't know where that question came from. I don't know if you know if it's answerable. Oh, well, probably because I would say yes, because that's the space I'm mainly in now. So, you know, when you're ever in a particular space, you feel like it's overwhelming in that space and you could probably yeah. make a case for either. So um, I, I've been out of secondary phys ed a long, long time now, and, and but I understand there's a lot of challenges there for secondary colleagues. Probably partly because it's primary peers had a lot of the political and financial attention, and um, that's bound to have an impact on what's happening, top-down governance, direction, strategy of a subject, um, what we're being asked to do, what we believe is the right thing to do, what's kind of coordinating all that really. And uh, and as you know, that's been something that's been really um a button presser should I say over the last 10 years really of mine and something I've I've probably aggressively sought out to to explore um in that time because it's been quite transformational actually in in the last decade or so and I think I think it is becoming more contested because there are lots of voices with a lot of vested interest in it and I was thinking about this actually um just last week around whether is that a strength is that an opportunity are we threatened by that and and possibly it's a combination of all those things isn't it um and and uh there's going to be a knock-on effect as soon as something happens whether it's a political agenda some funding or governance or teacher training direction or whatever it is there will be an impact on the subject for good or for bad and sometimes for both. <laughs> and so, for both. yeah, no, I think that's really, that really makes sense. Um, you know, whenever I, whenever I work with primary uh, pre-service or in-service teachers, I, I normally start by saying that, in my opinion, it's it's the most confused and confusing mm. um, part of school life. Um, but you know, as you said, as you touched upon, there's been well over. 20 years of ring fenced funding mm. that's a significant highly significant amount of public money that has gone into the subject so over the course of your career um you know some of those sort of milestones that you touched upon in your introduction like would you would you care to expand on where you see the strengths weaknesses opportunities and yeah. threats as, it, as, it, as they are at the moment and what people need sure. to try and navigate and think about yeah absolutely i mean <laughs> So there, there is no nine, as you mentioned, we've had over two and a half billion pounds. Um, uh, and that's just since London 2012, since 2013. But I think we often forget that um, we had a whole shift of funding a decade before that. So, you know, there's been a real growing over two decades, a growing momentum in, in primary physical education, which as I understand, which has been a weakness which we were aiming to develop into a strength was to support knowledge and confidence and competence in our primary generalist teachers. I think where we are now at a space where we can debate, depending on your side of the coin, whether we've improved that, whether we've made it worse, whether we've made it dependent on at the point of delivery and at the point of receiving money, is you can argue that from all different perspectives. Um, what what we now have though is a well embedded expectation around um generalist or teach teaching of physical education which has moved us into an era i think of now starting to think about what is a physical educator um what specialist know-how or knowledge do they need are we um and i think one of the biggest challenges we've got is locating what we mean by a physical educator and who is best placed in the primary school to be educating young people on whatever we conceptualize the content of physical education to be. So I, I think the challenges we now have are, we're still no further along, I don't think, in conceptualizing what a physical education curriculum is. Um, and, 
and maybe maybe that's a strength because we can be more bespoke based on writing that curriculum based on our own school or our own children's needs however that is but that should then dictate maybe who is the best educator to be delivering that curriculum um so i think we're we're in a space now where we have had a high expectation of finance and strategy and political um uh highlight really you know we've been there in the spotlight for a very long time that has embedded an expectation into primary PE and embedded an expectation around physical education delivery. And now we're, but we're still not in a space where after that we have much clarity or conceptualization over what a curriculum should look like and who is best to deliver that. And we've, we're moving more into, I, I believe this should be a specialist deliverer of physical education in the primary school, which for me is where I think we come to a particular threat to physical education as a subject and its future um and again that whole notion of specialists could be unpicked but i think we've come so far now we're almost merging into a new set of challenges and a new set of possibly problems or debates in primary pe that we hadn't anticipated we'd we'd meet when we first set out along this funding journey a couple of decades ago um, and it's shifted and, and, and morphed quite differently now I believe so I think that's our challenge still um, and whether we've addressed those earlier questions around confidence and competence of teachers um, perhaps we still got questions over that to be answered as well um, so yeah that sounds very gloomy and I don't I don't mean for it to be gloomy I think it's just morphed into something different um, over that time that we're still challenged with so I don't often I, leave if, Greg, Greg, <laughs> Greg pause for a breath. <laughs> I'm just trying to get my head around and unpick what you've just said, because I'm, I'm trying to do the whole sum it up succinctly. Yeah, I, I, Not that you weren't succinct, but are you saying, Vicky, that hmm. despite the two point whatever it was billion post 2012 and the other billions pre 2012, that we still can't conceptualise what a curriculum should look like yeah I am yeah I think that's what I'm saying and I think because of that we're still tying ourselves in knots therefore about who is the best person to deliver that curriculum so where we have moved into a space of different people now delivering a physical education curriculum I don't think we really know who that person should be because I'm not quite sure we fully grasped what our curriculum should be doing. And I don't think you can have one answered without the other, if that, yeah. does that make, yeah. is that a better way of putting it? Um, and that's yeah. not placing that one route is right or wrong. I think other factors are making decisions about what and who um, that we still haven't nailed. So external factors. And as soon as those external factors are pulled, political financial i don't i'm not convinced when all that rug is pulled from under our feet will be any further along in two decades i think they're very much reactionary and we haven't nailed those crucial questions yet potentially i don't know if that clarified yeah <laughs> no it does but it it beggars belief on one level hmm. that we, we're still in this quagmire you know we don't even know what's on the menu let alone who should be who's then for the best chef yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so are we a are we a pull up burger bar or a full buffet service where each kid can hopefully develop their own menu <clears throat> and decide what what their diet's going to be? Um, and there's huge questions there. And do you think that's why I don't know what your insight is, or you know, I whenever I work, which you know is fairly regularly with primary teachers, and you know we, you no, know, I'm. A few weeks ago, I, I won't mention the area, but there was uh, all the all the primary teachers or all the primary PE leads from one local authority. Uh, we were in the room. We had a really good day together. Uh, but it started by me asking. They flagged up uh, the A word in assessment uh, of assessment in PE. So I just, you know, we started by saying, "Well, what do you currently do?" And there was nineteen schools present in the room, and this is like not not an unusual response for that i've heard and the, the answer is well nothing really but like none of the schools had any way of not 
monitoring a child's progress in in PE. Now, if I, if I was being really contentious, I'd say, well, if there's no assessment, you actually, you probably haven't got a subject because a subject supposedly is a body of knowledge, whether that's physical knowledge or yep. cognitive knowledge or yep. embodied knowledge. And if if you can't, if you can't, I don't want to say measure, but at least talk articulately about what a child can do at the end of year six that they couldn't do or know or whatever it is in year three, you know, if there's no record of that, but and what's the impact on the child of just, you know, having this subject that there's never any learning conversation as a result of the structures that are in place. It's not, not the individuals. I, I genuinely believe that the vast majority of teachers I've ever worked with want to do a really good job. Now, whether they've got the support and the structures to do a really good job or whether there's a curriculum that helps them. Do, I mean, do you think we were better with the, the fuller curriculum and the levels, the, the much... Well, much maligned uh, levels, but at least I might, be, I might be really outspoken here, but I didn't have a particular issue with the level statements themselves in the um, earlier iteration of the curriculum, not the one now, obviously, before the levels were abolished. What I thought was a, was really problematic were how those levels were interpreted and enacted. So the language in the level statements, there was nothing sinister or contentious from my understanding of that it, it broke down the four strands of learning um in physical education across the four key stages and and just a, a progressive way of what we'd expect that to be um presented to us as a child moved through that physical education journey the problem was as greg you'll be well aware is those levels were being used in ways to level the child to a particular activity um so we were starting to use these levels in ways that were not expected to so yeah in a way I think those levels were fine um but the problem with leveling as we all know leads to interpretation of how any form of leveling or assessment is used but I, I don't think we're in a better position now that the levels and I'm speaking purely in physical education other subject colleagues might might feel differently here that um that we're in any better as broadly speaking in the subject of 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 not having an assessment framework or structure in place and every time I speak with teachers I say you know open your national curriculum you see that that little paragraph at the bottom of the program of study for key stage one or key stage two that's your attainment target and they're like oh do we have an attainment target for people well, yeah that's that statement and have we met it are they working towards it are we exceeding it so in a way we still have that but we don't have I don't think we've moved sufficiently on to know how to unpick the a huge array of content and pedagogical knowledge in those statements to help make really informed judgments around young people and I think we're falling into the same trap trap as levels did with trying to make sense of it in a way with quite limited knowledge um yeah so, so yeah. before we move on from there I mean do you the opportunity that you flagged up um, that to, for that to be realised, to have uh, almost a carte blanche, I know we've got a national curriculum as such, yeah. and, and, and obviously there's an Ofsted framework um, that you know inspectors might be looking for. But essentially, the schools in a decision uh, in a in a position where they can they've got an awful lot, probably more freedom than throughout both of our careers. Uh, than they've ever had as to what the curriculum should be, how they're going to monitor it, how they're going to assess it, how they're going to measure impact. Um, so that opportunity, is it fair to say, can only be grasped? I'd love to hear from people's comments on this, who listen, if anyone ever listens to it, on can only be grasped? <laughs> <laughs> can only be grasped if the subject lead is yeah. really well supported in developing subject and pedagogical knowledge yeah. to grasp that opportunity. Otherwise, it's very understandably tempting and seductive to say there's an off-the-shelf solution and I'm not I'm not demeaning all off-the-shelf no, no, solutions no, no. I think they probably are okay but some of them are probably very good well I, I know that a few are very good but it, they're still just tools right the people still need to work still with them and they need to bring they? them yeah. to life yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. so then you know we you know we've both been in ITE are, are we really giving teachers and future subject leaders the grounding to be able to oh. take advantage of that opportunity 
I mean, when, when, we're not scratching the surface, I don't think, Greg. And I think, you know, from the work and research I've done in ITE, we're looking at still minimal hours. But but my sense is from, and I'll, I'll sort of come back to that, that point you've raised as well, but I think from, from initial teacher education onwards, it's a start of a journey. Um, so I'm all, I always feel like I'm defending ITE when we're criticised in the literature or in, in the political spaces or practice spaces that we do not sufficiently prepare trainees. We prepare trainees sufficiently, as does any subject, particularly a foundation subject, with the same amount of time to begin their journey of learning how to teach PE. Do they have all the knowledge, skills, understanding, concepts to go out there and nail it from day one? Possibly not. And I wouldn't expect that. And if you speak to history colleagues or RE colleagues or art colleagues, they're like, well, we have the same hours as you. We just get them going as well. So IT gets, I think, quite a bad press and a bad hit in primary PE that we're not sufficiently preparing. But I really would throw it back and go, does any subject sufficiently prepare beyond introducing them to some big ideas and concepts to get them thinking about their lifelong journey and engagement as a professional in PE. And for me, that's where we've probably missed a huge opportunity in this country to really look at where we start in pre-service teacher and where funding and political strategy could build on that to really grow at every stage of a career, teacher's career, a strong, uh, understanding of physical education whether it's from an early career teacher a pre-service teacher all the way through to subject leader senior leader etc cetera, etc cetera. and and for me just sort of criticizing ITE is probably a, a not helpful one because regardless we're not going to get more time and uh and I don't think adding an extra 10 hours is a solution or an extra 30 hours because I did a four-year degree as I said I still felt I knew nothing it's just the start of something um yeah. And, and in Hampshire, what we've done there is I've I've tried to as an IT provider to recognise that we, we're a big provider in, in Hampshire for primary education. And it's like, right, let's look at the organisations around that pre-service teacher when they leave. Where will they be? Let's work with the council. That's their now employer. Um, and we set up a subject leader network of now we've got about a fifth of all primary schools on that network. Um, and those subject leaders come to us six times a year. And we just continue to support them. It's like 75 quid a year for them. And it just covers costs. And we say, look, every time we'll lead CPD driven on what the children's needs are in your school, your needs as a professional. And we'll, we'll constantly respond to that changing need for you guys as a, as a county of subject leaders and where you need to go. And, and, and we've stripped it right back, right back to curriculum planning, right back to assessment, right back to, have you heard of this model of teaching? Well, let's teach it to you. And, and um, we've now linked up with Beds, Bedfordshire, um, Paul, um, Paul Salmon and Beds, and we we yeah. brought those networks together for community yeah. of practice and sharing. And I, th I think we do that on a shoestring. And I just feel like with even one percent of what the PE premium money has done, we could have done something quite transformational bringing initial teacher education local authorities active partnerships together to really think through that teacher's career journey um and now we're having to do it in silos which is fine we'll still do that but but yeah i think i think we've still got a long way to go in in that teacher's development journey i don't know i don't even think that was a question you asked me but i went with it sorry greg <laughs> well i think that's fascinating though because it always reminds me of a really critical incident that i had that really challenged my thinking when I was talking to the legend that is Mike Jess uh, <laughs> up in Scotland. And he, uh, this was a few years back, and he just finished. And you, you'll, you'll probably remember he had a serious grant up in Edinburgh to, yeah. to roll out, uh, I believe it was called Let's Move or Better Move. First Moves. First, first Moves. moves, first moves. Well, basic, I said, moves was, basic Moves. Sorry, basic, basic Moves. Basic Moves. I said, What was your takeaway from that? And he said, I'm never taking a contract like that again. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me airing that. <laughs> I don't no, think there's any <laughs> and, uh, and I said, why not? He said, because a one-day CPD event has zero impact. And then, of course, you, you mentioned earlier that you worked with Gene Keyes, who you know, yeah. spent uh, many years researching what is impactful professional development. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, well, what did you do then, Mike? And he said, well, we just got together. He said, one of the things I learned is that 
professional development needs to be ongoing as your as as per your subject leaders group i'm not sure you've taken it quite as far as him because he said it also should be informal and i said what do you mean by informal he said well we meet in a pub <laughs> yeah we okay. did we are <laughs> And, uh, not not with 80 of them or 90 of them we might we might overwhelm a pub in Winchester with that. and, uh, and uh, yeah so he said we meet in the pub and uh, we meet every every six weeks and I said right um, do the teachers get like credits for this or do they pay for it or and he said no no and I kept saying well, why are they there he said professional development yeah and yeah. he said you know, you put a group of like-minded people together and bounce ideas, no expert in the room. Yeah, I, I mean, easy for him to say, he's, okay, you yeah. know, he's much respected, but, you know, he's there, he's bouncing ideas back, he's challenging here. You know, he's probably talking about complexity every every so often, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, but, you know, and, and they're moving forward on practice. And I, I just, and we tried to do that a little bit at Kingston before the lockdown, and yeah. nowhere near on the scale he did, but it was wonderful learning conversations. Yeah. Um, but of course, people are busy, etc. Um, yeah, I think, models I think of you're professional right there. development. Well, both both Jean and Mike have been real trailblazers for leading big funded projects. Like Jean was tasked with the Start to Move stuff years ago um, when she was at Roehampton, actually, before she came to Roehampton, and and Mike in Scotland with that. And and actually, Mike and Jean and Nicola and the team at Edinburgh and and around that have really kind of come together and and really rethought what CPD is and what it's needed, as you said. And we, we've started to use Jean's model of professional development linked to children's learning needs and, and applied that within our subject leadership networks. And 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 you can see there's a little bit of the teachers going, oh, aren't you just going to tell us what we're going to learn? And we're like, no, no. And, and that is quite scary as a coordinator of a group like that, because you don't know what they're going to ask for and you don't even know if you can help them with that. But But I think what they've got from that is a community of practice a regular point where they know there's something for them they can come and talk they can ask questions they've got a point of contact in between the weeks and spaces um where we can help support and pick that up and and I just think that's been quite powerful as an initial teacher education provider for a lot of those colleagues who recognize what we've done with them and their current employer coming together with some consistent messaging and support that feels safe um non-judged and and yet, so I've learned a lot from Mike and um, Nicola and, and Jean's work around professional development. And, and you're right, it just makes me laugh. I, just, I could just imagine Mike on a round of golf having a pub a pint afterwards. And yeah, that's, that's our CPD for today. And that's and learning. Absolutely right, absolutely that's right. It's a place to learn. But, I'm, you know, touching upon that theme as well, increasingly, I think if you put a group of professionals in a room, the, the answer's probably in the room. Yeah. And they might need a little bit of unlocking and it might need a little bit of probing. But you've got people who teach across subject areas as they do in primary school. They, they've got the answers are in the They've got that in their locker easily. And it's just bringing it across and applying it to. PA. I'm a very unpopular voice, Greg, when I've probably been one of the only people I don't know. I know colleagues and have come on board somebody to support to say, we need to get rid of the PE premium and stop funding PEs at such a high level because I think it's distracting. I think it's distracting away from some of the, the points we know that lead to quality, develop, professional development, community of practice. It doesn't need billions of pounds, actually. But who's going to be the person that says don't fund our subject? You know, no one wants to be that person. So th there is a balance to be struck between appropriate levels of investment. Um, yeah can help with areas that we know from our research and engagement with schools about what's effective. There's a fantastic study being done at Cambridge University on the impact of professional development yeah, on the yeah. premiums. Did you see that? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've spoken quite a lot with that researcher and she's she's really keen to tap into some of the networks and the research networks we've used in our, um, Gerald and I have used in previous studies. And, and she's just really keen to find that answer is, does that high level of investment, has that led to quality teacher professional development? Um, and at the moment, it would suggest no. Um, but but I, Yeah, I, I really take your point because I think if you get the balance wrong, that the funding, the ring fence funding, others, physical education, doesn't it? It makes it the other subject. And how many teachers is that, you know, the behaviour strategies, for example, don't apply, they don't come across. 
Um, the lesson doesn't sound yeah. like any other lesson. So the year twos, of course, they're picking up on this is glorified playtime. And, yeah. or, you know, if they're happy and clappy, then we're doing a really good job. But those, all of those really well established classroom routines are not being transferred. And the kids and the teachers think they're in some very different space. And that, that takes me back to confused and confusing um, through, again, I really want to emphasise. Um, not demonising the practitioners in that. I think it is, they're in a very difficult Absolutely. space. And I, I get what you're saying, that the funding might have actually exasperated that other otherness of PE. I, I put at the end of one of the papers we did, one of the studies, that I genuinely believe teachers believe they're doing the right thing when they make decisions about how to spend the money or to outsource the money. But it does that individual a disservice. We all have bodies. We all coordinate a physical body. There's nothing more powerful. We know that the role models that young people draw on are the people closest to them, their families, their loved ones, their trusted adults, their teachers around them. Therefore, bringing a specialist of someone, you know, we bring this person in because they can do. Therefore, does that mean my teacher can't do? I think the message is around the body in that space. And, I, and that's not to take away from the brilliant skills and knowledge that those outsourced people are bringing in. But it does other us in the curriculum. You're absolutely right. And I think that's that's why I said earlier in that garbled roundabout way, we've morphed into a different beast now um, with a whole different set of challenges. And, and yeah, I, I think that's that's our new phase going forward that we'll have to either learn to navigate to live with the other and how that fits or we have to rethink it again okay. yeah and i'm not even going to start having a conversation at this stage of our <laughs> recording on the inverse gender relationship between the primary edu uh, teaching uh, body which i believe is around 87 percent women yeah. and i'm not sure there's official figures but i suspect the pe specialists Mm -hmm. are the are about 90 percent men and i'm always uh, well i think it's probably a, a brilliant area of study um so anyone listening can pick this up and do their <laughs> masters or post-grad stuff on it but what impact does that have on children when miss teaches them everything and she's brilliant and clever and kind and meets all of our learning needs apart from when it comes to pe because yeah, Chris comes in and, and takes us. It, uh, it, it reinforces that mind-body dualism again, and and yeah. and we, we are a physical education. And and I had a, yeah. I've got a PGR student who's doing a wonderful study at the moment on sex education and physical education, and she's asking questions to phys ed teachers about where's your role in teaching sex education. You are number one person who teaches about the body. Do you teach them around pleasure and risk and touch? Oh, you know, and you can imagine the responses from teachers being asked those questions and the safeguarding concern that's flagging up. And it's like, well, where does physical education have the job? Where does the body start and stop in physical education and that child's education? Um, and it's just a fascinating question to pose. And I think we're very safe in a very sport and physical activity world, but the body is physical in lots of things. So that's a that's a really interesting, um, slightly nerving for some teachers in that in that interview process. But it, it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, yeah, lots lots to unpick potentially there. But um, yeah, uh, that is yeah, that really is fascinating. Uh, yeah, it, it's just maybe you know, a, that, that, that's I think that's a follow up. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the... might are on. I'd love yeah, to and, hear more about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I mean, that's a, it's a really great study, but it's an interesting question broadly about if we are physical education, <clears throat> what constitutes as the body and physical? Yeah, and then absolutely. What constitutes is the role and content and knowledge of our subject. And absolutely, big themes, and big themes of discipline in the body for certain yeah. reasons to yeah. work in a certain way, to look a certain way, to yeah. function. And what are those ways and where do we demand? Yeah, brilliant questions. Wow. Um, Vicky, before we wrap up this conversation, yeah. I'm, I know that you're now working part time in HE and part time for a charity, uh, which sounds amazing. So uh, I'm just going to hand over back over to you to talk about your slightly different career path and the yeah. changes that it's taken. So, yeah, thank you. So the charity I've I've been actually involved with since they started about four, 2018, whatever year we're in now, four years ago, um, charity Stormbreak, which is a mental health 
a movement charity and um, it was founded by uh, my colleague and dear friend Martin Yelling who was a PE teacher himself trained at Loughborough with all the the wonderful colleagues up at Loughborough University back in the day and 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 you know interestingly coming back to him into physical education after having time out in running and elite running and coaching he's kind of gone where have we moved on in that you know just what we've been saying about how we use the body and movement um to educate children about a whole load of things and so what the charity does is it uses movement as a vehicle to educate universally educate children at primary age about aspects to do with mental health and this is a very early early educative um approach it's a biosocial approach so it's it's connecting the biological the social the physical with our understanding of quite tricky concepts around mental health and well-being so yeah my my role there is to join a, a wonderful small but wonderful team of 10 colleagues who are who are navigating the complex world of health social care education um, and how we can best support schools, parents, and even GP practices and spaces like that now in a social prescription way that can support trusted adults to support young people. Yeah, so that's that's the other part of the day job now. <laughs> and how does that work? Does a school reach out to Stormbreak to become a Stormbreak school? Or um, yeah, so... tell, tell listeners how they could get involved if they think that's so, useful yeah. for their school. Very simply, um, as with most things now, there's there's a website, um, uh, www.stormbreak.org.uk, and parents and schools um, can log on for a free account. Um, we've had the wonderful support of, um, we were one of 10 charities from BBC Million and Me when the pandemic broke, so a lot of our content is free and accessible always for schools and um, parents and carers and trusted adults to use, and they're just videos and materials which are five ten minute movement activities which foreground a concept of mental health so uh, resilience self self-worth relationships hope and optimism and self-care so each video will foreground one of those concepts and use movement as a vehicle in which to help the child recognize respond and regulate a particular concept of their feelings or emotions um so anyone can log on for a free account or um at hello stormbreak on twitter or um at hello stormbreak.org.uk for an email just to say we'd like to be part of school training we do a 12-week program where we work with senior leaders in schools and school advocates to embed um, a whole school cultural approach to mental health and movement um and we work with those schools for 12 weeks and of course then ongoing we don't just leave them after 12 weeks to to fend for themselves so yeah, there is a school program. We're also moving into, as I said, NHS social prescription models. We've worked with looked after children and young carer groups. So really the potential is endless here. If you're a primary age person or a trusted adult working with a primary age child and would like some very early educative support on how to work with that child to manage and regulate their well-being mentally, then we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. That sounds amazing. And just to reiterate, a school could come on board for 12 weeks at no cost of week training school. um no it there's a there's a cost of um it's 1500 pound for the 12 weeks but we usually okay. work as a bit of a middleman getting grants and funds um okay. some of our schools use p premium actually as a whole school okay. support for okay. movement and well-being um and then that obviously accesses a whole load of support and evaluation and evidence for schools to support their um, governance. And the, and the legacy is hopefully that cultural change and as well as huge learning for all members of the school community, not least the teachers, Absolutely. in being better equipped to yeah. enter this space. Um, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm also, Greg, linking both conversations together, working on a project with ITE providers, SKITS and school-based and university-based, to, to look at a project called ITE Connect, Stormbreak Connect, where we're looking at supporting pre-service teachers in understanding early concepts around mental health and well-being through movement through initial teacher education as well. Um, so that's Fantastic. something that's in development. Bringing the Fantastic. two worlds together, that will be. <laughs> Fantastic. Two complex... Um... And, se and sensitive worlds that can do so much good when delivered well and you know hopefully uh, avoid um, the opposite of that really yeah, so yeah. Vicky that sounds absolutely great love to continue the conversation and, and hear more about the impact of Stormbreak and maybe we'll record that in a few months time 
Um, can I thank you wholeheartedly for a, a fascinating conversation? It's always, always great listening to you, and thank you so much for your time. Oh, likewise, Greg. Thank you so much. Thank you.